And welcome to the SpartanMag.com VCast. Jim Comproni, Rico Cooney, Breslin Center, Michigan State, January 2nd, 2020. The Spartans 76-56 over Illinois, the number 14 ranked Michigan State Spartans. Rico, thanks for joining us today. Appreciate that. All right, so Michigan State, I, you know, coming out today, it's Big Ten, back into Big Ten play. And I don't know if you could see it at home or if you were here at the arena, but intensity right yeah. away. And Michigan State established that intensity, going up something like 11 to two. Right. Loose balls, rebounds, Aaron Henry big on the defensive glass early on. To begin with, Michigan State came out, threw some punches. They were ready to play tonight to begin with, and that set the tone for the rest of the night. It did, and I thought, uh, as, as expected, Cassius led the way early on. He kind of set a tone for them as far as execution offensively. And then I think that allowed everybody else to kind of get in rhythm on both sides of the ball, on both the offensive side and the defensive side of the floor. And Cassius was quick tonight. Now, he missed the last game with a bone bruise. Now, Izzo was talking tonight that he couldn't go long spurts and a foul trouble actually played to Cassius's advantage for the long term, although they didn't want that to happen when it did happen in the first half. But when he was in there, he may not have had that long 15 round endurance level today, but his quickness was on today, and Illinois had trouble with his quickness from the beginning. Yeah, and I mean, if you noticed, um, I kind of noticed that, that old, what we saw last year when Michigan State went on that run, how he was able to slash into those little grooves and those little holes and get himself open to get good shots. I mean, a lot of times, you know, guys will slash in there and they'll be out of control, but he was under control and he was picking his spots and Illinois didn't have an answer for that early. And and when they when they miss shots, as their coach talked about in the post game, that I think that kind of doomed them the rest of the way. Yeah, Illinois usually shoots better than this. Michigan State's defense had something to do with that. Michigan State ends up shooting 31% from three-point range, but they were above 33% until you know the the, the bench guys came in and right. missed, missed a couple of late three-pointers. Yeah. If Michigan State's above 33% three-point shooting, they're usually going to be tough to beat with the way they can play defense. And tonight they played good defense. Illinois shot 29% from three from the field. Illinois came in, I think, ranked number two in the Big Ten in field goal percentage offense. And for them to go 29% from the field, 22 out of 75. Underwood was just like, well, you can't win games when you when you can't miss open when you miss shots. Yeah. He felt like he felt he like he liked their the shot shots selection. Yep, he liked the shot selection, but they just didn't finish. And I mean. The other big thing that, that comes out here is they went three for 28 from beyond the arc. I mean, I think if they even, if they can go, what, 25%, it's a different game. But they went, they ended up 10% from beyond the arc. You're, you're not going to win a lot of games like that. And what I want to see is as you get into the Big Ten season, you know, a lot of fans get upset because Michigan State seems to have an opponent who has a career night against Michigan State. Right. It just seems to seem it happens once in a while. But if you watch enough basketball, you'll see guys have career nights against everybody around yep. the country. Now, just because you watch a bunch of Michigan State basketball, you think about the handful of games where Michigan State loses or gets, to, gets into difficulties. There are times when teams, when guys shoot because the way Michigan State plays that gap defense, they will let you shoot over the top. Okay, right. so Illinois was able to shoot over the top tonight. Percentage-wise, it usually doesn't get that ugly. But Michigan State's a little bit like, be my guest. You go, you go ahead and shoot those. They might have a couple guys that they want to really focus on. But for the most part, you, you prove you're hot, then we'll adjust to it. In the meantime, Michigan State, a concerted effort, a worried task of dealing with Coburn. Uh, Kofi Coburn, the excellent freshman for Illinois, came in there leading score, about 17 points a game, nine rebounds a game. He's had some monster games against people. Seven feet, 290, a guy that's getting better every two weeks. Yeah. And today, Marcus Bingham was guarding him. And Marcus Bingham is a guy that's getting better in his own way every three weeks or so. Yeah. And Bingham, a good night tonight, although he didn't score any points, and Izzo was quick to give him credit. Brad Underwood, Illinois' head coach, was quick to give Marcus Bingham credit. I'm not sure when I've seen a game in which someone didn't score a point and justifiably is receiving as much credit as Marcus Bingham is tonight, Rico. Yeah, I mean, if you look at it and if you look at, you know, the, the, the 12 rebounds and the five blocks, he affected the game. He affected the outcome of the game. Now, obviously, Illinois not shooting well, you know, was a big part of, of things. But but Bingham affected this game and the way he was able to play Colburn. And I thought that, uh, that uh, Xavier Tillman gave me probably the best quote about 
Marcus. He said he had one of those Kenny Goins games. Mm -hmm. He said last year Kenny would have a game where he might score two or three points, but he'd have the most important rebound. He'd have the most important screen. He'd have the most important, you know, block on a play. And he said that's what Bingham reminded him of. He said he had a Kenny Goins game tonight. I can remember once or twice when Kenny Goins might have scored zero points and got 18 rebounds against somebody, maybe Louisville back when he was a sophomore or something yeah. like that. It's interesting that Xavier would remember that. And Bingham, he's a guy that we, we've heard from coaches and players. He's a guy that gets down on himself a little bit, a sophomore that's trying to blossom and, and find his own footing. Today, the onus was on him. Yep. He's guarding Coburn. And Coburn ends up two out of ten from the floor. And they were going to Coburn. I mean, they were trying to post him up yep. any chance they could. And Bingham was wrestling with him and, and, and expending a lot of energy to try to maintain pos position. And Izzo says that Bingham is down about ten pounds over the last three weeks. Right. So it, as, as big as he was trying to get a couple weeks ago, some of that is vanished off. Yep. So... He's going against a guy who's 290 yep. and giving it everything he had. And last year at this time, against someone like that, Bingham would have gotten thrown into the third row a few times. Yeah. And Bingham, um, I'm not saying he was Patrick Ewing in there against Coburn, but, I mean, as, as was a worthy, willing sparring partner. And Coburn, and they, they, you know, Coburn got in foul trouble, only played eight minutes in the first half. Beginning of the second half, they were trying to go right back to Coburn, and they still couldn't get it done. Right, and I think that was the thing that um, that Bingham did well. He established himself early. He took some punches, but he didn't back down. And I think maybe that might have surprised Coburn a little bit. Coburn might have thought he could, you know, bully him and then have his way in the paint, and, and he didn't back down despite, what, almost a 100-pound difference, I think? between Bingham yeah. and Coburn like and he yeah and he he held his own in there and but I think the where the advantage came was first of all you got the youth of Coburn even though Bingham's young but I thought Bingham's footwork throughout the night was excellent I mean watching him get himself in a position even when he didn't get the rebound to box out his guy was I thought tonight was a huge step for him as far as his growth and maturation and what he can do I mean he started tonight but what he can do in in any role whether he's starting or coming off the bench and you know early in the year when Michigan State played Duke he was matched up against Vernon Carey and everybody's just kind of holding their breath for Michigan yeah. State it didn't turn out real well Vernon Carey was dominant now Carey is further along in his development than Coburn is but Coburn's going to be real good soon and he's real good on most nights right now but after this, with Bingham, I mean, he's not always going to be this great. But right. you, but you, in terms of holding your breath and crossing your fingers, I don't think Michigan State has to do that with him anymore. It's like this is what you can do, aspire to get to that level, and then some. But he became a little bit more of a known commodity right. and less of a, an, an assumed liability. Yeah. Because of that, that's a, that's this, this team, this team yeah. grows a little bit because right. that, because you know you're only you're, if, if you have a leak anywhere, the boat don't float. Right. And now that part going against an aircraft carrier, um, they might have a, s some tools and equipment there that they may not have believed in three weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, like I said, when you can, you know, as a staff, when you can be confident enough to throw him into a situation and know what you're going to get as opposed to hoping what you're going to get that's huge I mean the other thing I noticed tonight was the guard play I mean Cash has played what 25 minutes yeah but you know they had they had that combination of, of, of Rocket and Foster in there and those guys didn't really lose a beat and I'm going to tell you something if they get to the point where they can depend on those guys for 10, 15 minutes of solid play mm -hmm. while Cassius gets rest because we all thought by the time they got to the final four, Cassius was beat up. He just, you know, he was playing, what, 30, 35 minutes a game? I mean, and you go through a Big Ten schedule and you're playing that many minutes, it's going to have an effect on you at the end. And I think it did, you know, the further they went in the tournament. But if they can depend on Watts and Lawyer to give them 10, 15 solid nearly mistake-free minutes a game, this team's going to be tough to beat in, in the tournament. And in true Michigan State fashion, there's a lot of those little 
tang intangible areas that Michigan State is constantly working on to become stronger, and that's one of them. Foster Lawyer scored in the teens the last two games, came out in this game, and when Winston got into foul trouble, got a second foul, I think Michigan State was up 11. Yep. Michigan State only was up six at halftime, so the lead did disintegrate. It did, it did vanish a little bit, not completely, but while Lawyer was out there, for the first time, maybe it's just my imagination, but I felt like the first time in Lawyer's career that Winston gets two fouls, and lawyer comes in, and nobody's panicking. Nobody's like holding their breath, like how you know, are the wheels going to come off? How long can they sit, Winston? It was like, okay, lawyer scored 15 or 16 last game out. Comes out, hits an early three when yep. they uh, when they under rotated and left him open. What was interesting after that, at, when he hit that three, I saw a stat that he had made nine of his last ten three point attempts. Yeah. Of course, it was four for four in, in the last game. The next time he had a shot opportunity, they ran a real quick action, a little. Like a sideball screen, almost a dribble handoff, a real quick action uh, that Lawyer became somewhat open in the right wing, but I think it was Frazier was all over him. Yeah. And that's the first time I've seen an opponent recognize Lawyer <laughs> and get out on him on the catch, like recognizing where he was right. and getting out on him, and he gave it right back to Tillman for a driving layup. Yeah. Tillman got that layup because they respected Lawyer. And they so pulled I, a man out of there. They yeah. pulled a man out of there, so they gave Tillman a little more working room. And I think the Western Michigan tape probably helped. I'm sure the Illinois yeah. coaching staff watched the Western Michigan and said, hey, if you leave this guy open, he's going to knock down shots. Yeah. And so I think they saw that on tape. And so now when you get it, well, you get – um. You get 14 minutes out of him. You get uh, 17 out of Watts, and they give you 13 points. And what? No turnovers. No turnovers. No turnovers. Come on. I mean, you know, you know, Tom, being Tom, said, you know, we did some good things and we did some bad things. But I think this is definitely a good thing. When you got those guys, they can give you 13 points and no turnovers in a combined what was it? Uh, almost what 25 minutes? I think. Tom will take that. You know, when he looks at the tape and and sees how that went, he's like, I'll take that. Mm -hmm. And if they can just give Michigan State that all season long, again, I think this makes this team even tougher to beat. And Watts is going to do more than that. He played 17 minutes tonight. That might be where he settles in. Earlier in the year, he was playing 20-plus. He's still coming back yeah. from his stress reaction injury. He had a few minutes at the point today, whatever minute. You know, the lawyer had 14 minutes. And uh, Watts maybe had five minutes at the point. Watts spent a lot of time at the two. And Izzo, Izzo keeps telling people, man, Watts is going to be good. Right. He likes that defense first. They're, starting, they're still trying to reinvent his game a little bit. There was a time when Watts got out of the top of the key and went and jab step and missed a three-pointer. And that, that was his game in the old days. But I don't mind jab step shot. But he's done it a lot and rarely makes those. I know Conanite doesn't like that. But today was the first time I saw Izzo tell – tell him you could see him from where we were Izzo was like uh, jab step stop that right. drive yep. Izzo wants Watts to drive more he did more of that against Western Mission drove dish uh, today drove made a nice teardrop back in October November Watts would have driven all the way to the rim and gotten it blocked or committed a charge yeah so he's working on his game a little bit or been out of control and had a turnover yeah yeah and gotten himself like up in the air or in a bad situation and ended up turning over the ball but remember Tom talked that he thought that Watts' time on the bench when he was out with that stress reaction may have been the biggest benefit of all because he was able to see things that were going on and see the things that the coaches were telling him about as far as, you know, when you go here, you got to do this. When you go here, you got to do this. And now that he was actually able to see it, then he can take it and apply it to his game on the court. And you can see he's growing. He's yeah. growing. And, and, it, and I think he's still going to make mistakes, but yeah. he's definitely growing. He is. And you can see the mental clockwork for Rocket Watts now has changed a little bit. You can see some of the, the things he learned on the bench. He's attempting to apply those to the court. Yeah. And he's, uh, he's, he's Izzo loves him as a student because he tries to, tries to impress, tries to – facilitate his teammates. Yep. Izzo loves working with him, and he's going to continue to progress, and that's going to be fun to watch. Now, I know Izzo and those guys were really concerned about um, about Coburn and, and Georgie. I can't pronounce his last name. The big guy from the Republic of Georgia. He's the Republic, I, can't, I don't know. If it's the, the, the nation of Georgia. Yep, yep. Uh, as he said, he's been around for two years. I, I worked on it all last week, and I still can't Best pronounce Hanishvili. it. Yes. 
Yep. And, and he's three out of 12, and he's a crafty left-hander, and he can get hot against you. But for both of those guys to go five out of 22, the way Tillman played defense right. on him, because you need someone like Tillman to guard that guy, because that guy is um, hes versatile. Yep. He can go outside and shoot. Right. He can do some crafty stuff off the dribble. Yeah, he's got, so, the, he's got the definite European game where, you know, he's a big man who can shoot and can take you off the dribble and post you up. But the other thing that kind of stuck out to me is, like, look at the combined rebounds for, for Coburn and, and Benjamin Sfeely. They, what, 14 rebounds? And, you know, I know that Illinois came in as one of the top rebounding teams and one of the top field goal percentage teams because those guys are getting easy, easy looks under the basket. And uh, Michigan State did what they needed to do to take them out of their comfort zone. Rebounds ended up 48-48 even. Rarely we used to Michigan State come out of a game and feel good about being even in rebounding. Right. This game, Izzo didn't really rant on it much. Maybe he will in practice. But like you said, Illinois among the top one or two in the country in yeah. rebounding, I think. I don't know if that's total rebounding or rebounding differential, rebounding percentage. I'm not sure what it is, but among the best. And here's an interesting stat. Illinois had 10 team rebounds. Yeah. yeah that's rare to see 10. It is. You know, ball goes out of bounds and they get the, te the team rebound. Yep. But those add up. Uh, 20 offensive rebounds, that's more than Michigan State ever wants to allow. But when you're missing 53 shots, yep. 20 offensive rebounds percentage-wise is not t a terribly ugly number. But Izzo's going to be on these guys yep. to uh, to uh, get to uh, rebound even better against Michigan. <laughs> Michigan's coming up on Sunday here, the first showdown of the year between these teams. Michigan State three times beat them, of course, swept them two times with championships on the line. The most recent one here was one of the more important games in Breslin Center history. Michigan State controlled that game from start to finish. Michigan having a rallying cry, no question about it, wanting to come back, get some retribution. Juwan Howard mentioned that on Sunday after they played whatever team it was they played on Sunday. It might have been Presbyterian, I'm not sure. But he was talking about that after the game, fully aware that they lost three times last year. Their players have mentioned it. They did not play a midweek game. So they've been waiting all week for Michigan State. Michigan State, I think it did them some good to get back in the Big Ten play, right. get back in the ring, throw some punches, take some punches, answer. Now a two-day turnaround is not ideal. But I think Michigan State is in is in good position to play well on Sunday. Even though Winston is coming off the, the bone bruise a little bit, has not practiced a ton. Rocket Watts has not practiced a ton. Uh, Xavier Tillman battling the flu today. You have to hope. The flu bug does not spread to other players. Yeah. yeah. But uh, if that doesn't happen, I like the way Michigan State is positioned right now to play a good 40 minutes against the Wolverines on Sunday. Right. And, and, and by the way, it was it was it was UMass Lowell. Lowell. Okay. Yeah. yeah it was UMass Lowell. That which, would have been a good hockey game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It would have been a better hockey game than basketball game. But yeah, I mean, and the other thing is the livers factor. Is livers going to play? You know, are they going to try to push him to play, or are they just going to leave him out? We don't know. But, I mean, I think he makes a big difference as far as how well their defense runs. And uh, we'll see. I mean, obviously, the you can pretty much figure that the that the battle, the guard battle, could, you know, potentially just cancel, cancel itself out. So that means that, you know, other guys are going to have to step up and do their job in order to give MSU an advantage. Yeah, Xavier Simpson, a great point guard for yep. Michigan. In watching him this year, I think he's slimmed down a little bit and gotten a little bit quicker. I mean, last year he was rock solid and tough and everything, yeah. but he was a little thicker, which served him well. Right. But I swear, I, I mean, I don't read everything that's coming out of Ann Arbor. Yeah. Maybe they've touched on it. Maybe it's been covered there. I'm not sure, but just looking at him, I think he's slimmed down a little bit. It's made him quick, and the way that two-man game operates with himself and Teske, yeah. it's excellent. They lost to Illinois in Champaign back in December. That day, Illinois... Um, did not leave the shooters alone. They allowed Simpson and Teske to operate their screen and roll and, and, and tried to live with it. Right. And they didn't leave. Now, Livers was playing back then. Yep. But they didn't leave Livers alone or their other shooters, Eli Brooks. They stayed on those guys and allowed the two-man game to happen, and they were willing to just lose yep. with that. But percentages-wise, they didn't want to leave those shooters the way those shooters had played in the Bahamas, yep. beating Gonzaga, North Carolina, the way they played played well against Oregon. That's what Illinois chose to do. Michigan State will not play that way. They never play that way. They no. want to play inside out. They want to take away the gaps. They'll get out on one or two of them, but they'll challenge Michigan to get hot. Now, Michigan's capable of getting hot, but yep. it'll be harder without livers. But Michigan's playing good basketball. They're ranked number 12 in the country. They're ranked higher. I'm assuming Michigan State will be favored, but it's going to be fun. 
Aaron Henry played well today in an interesting capacity. Coburn gets in foul trouble. Illinois went small yeah. with uh, with um, Dosunmu moving to the four pretty much. Yep. So Michigan State put Aaron Henry at the four. And I asked Aaron Henry about that. Did you guys work on that? He said no. Yeah. He said we didn't really anticipate them going small. They were you know worried about their size and all right, that. Right, because that's when they brought in Griffin. And, and the, he actually did well. He scored, what, 17 points? Number, number he was five? Their, yeah, he was their second leading scorer, was it? Number zero. Yeah, yeah. Griffin came in and, and, and gave them some, some punch off the bench offensively. And and obviously at that point you could tell that, that Underwood was looking for something. You know, he was looking for some kind of kick out of their offense because they had, they missed so many shots. And and I think he was right. They got some good open, sh- good open good looks, but they just were not falling. And then when you – and then when you take – you know Coburn out of the game, or or or, uh, or Benjamin Sfili down low in the post. There's not a lot there with that Illinois offense. So I think they got into a they got into a, a ruts somewhat because they were trying to force it in there, and it and it just didn't work for him. You know Dosumu usually plays pretty well, and he scored 18, but he was eight out of 20. Felice coming off the bench usually plays pretty well. Made one field goal, two points. Yep. When you go back over the film, I'm sure that Michigan State's Wing defense. Gabe Brown was probably better than we realized on defense. Yeah. Aaron Henry was probably better than we realized. Even when Aaron, or, and Watts was too. Even when Henry played some minutes at the four. Now Henry uh, played more at the four today than he ever has by a long margin. He probably played six minutes at the four. Yeah. When they when Illinois went small, Michigan State went small. They put Henry at the four, and Henry's like, we didn't work on that. And I just have to know the four, yep. and we ran limited things, so I knew what to do. But it, it just so happened that when Michigan State ran those sets, the ball came to Henry, and he drove against Osunmu, yep. and he scored like six points at the four today. Right. You know, I think what did what did Henry end up with? 12, Ten points. Yep. Ten points. Six of them were as a power forward. Yeah. So that is something Michigan State can tuck away. Now, they're going to want to play Malik Hall more than they did tonight against most opponents. Right. But against some opponents, if things are not going well, that's a card you can play. Let's put Aaron at the four, try to get something going. Or if you go against Michigan, and if Michigan goes small, you're, you've are you become a little bit more Swiss Army knife capable. Right. Off tonight, something they didn't anticipate, but Henry delivered that playing at the four today. Something Izzo didn't mention in the post game, but that surely was interesting. Yeah, and I think I think you were right in earlier saying that maybe we just didn't give Gabe Brown enough credit. But if you look at his game, I thought, I mean, what, one turnover, I thought he was smart tonight. I thought Gabe Brown played smart tonight. You know, he because he's capable of spectacular things. But I think tonight he thought up better of it and played smart. And then, of course, you know, there was that one rebound he had where he literally jumped over Coburn to get it, and that got the crowd pumped up. And so, you know, and that's the kind of plays that Gabe Brown can make. He can make spectacular plays to kind of get your get your juices flowing. But but tonight, I thought Gabe Brown was a smart player. I, I didn't think he was trying to do the spectacular all the time. He was playing way, you know, inside himself. And he's got the athleticism to be spectacular, but I thought tonight he was a smart player. And yeah, he took good shots. Yep. Four out of four from the three from the free throw line at a time when Michigan State was in a free throw slump in the first half. Yeah. Gabe Brown did not score in the first half, scored twelve all in the second half. Right. When this game started to when Michigan State took control, he was a huge reason why they yep. took control. Yep. So he can build on that also. All in all, a good day of basketball for Michigan State. What'd you think of the atmosphere? I liked it. I mean what we had the alumni band, we had the alumni is on, and I looked I when I walked in, I sat down, I looked around, I'm like, this place is full. Full. It was full. It was full. It was jumping. So I said, hey, you know what? Because I always think it's tough, you know, when you have a couple games. Like, <laughs> you know, somebody mentions later when we were, like, waiting for Izzo to come in. Boy, it's a good thing that Michigan game wasn't, like, tonight. You know, that would have been kind of a, 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 a an injustice to have, you know. But but I think this, this fan, this group, they would have held its own in a game against Michigan tonight. This thing turned off. We'll go ahead and finish up. I agree that thing. I kept looking at my watch because it goes 20 minutes, it shuts off. But the holiday crowds here at Michigan State over the years, Izzo touched on it in the post game. It's a great tradition for Michigan State. Um, like he says, something that does not happen in a lot of places. I know Doug Wojcik is an analyst here now. When he was an assistant coach here back in 04, 05, he came from North Carolina, the ACC. And there's plenty of power programs that don't fill seats during 
the, uh, the holiday the games. Break, right, yeah. And I understand January 2nd's not technically Christmas anymore, but you right. still have people that are still in town from the weekends, from the holiday weekend that maybe yeah. don't live in the state of Michigan anymore. Right. They want to come back and watch Michigan State, and they're into it. They get here early. Yeah. When you when you come through the Hall of History, there's more people there earlier, and it's more of a museum feel. You, you see people in the Hall of History that you can tell it's the first time they've been here in a while, right. and it makes for a great atmosphere, and it's a credit to Michigan State's fans. So we'll go ahead and wrap it up. For Rico Cooney, anything else, Rico? Well, just the, uh, again, I thought, you know, noticing the crowd, and what you saw tonight was a lot of parents with kids, you know, parents and groups with two or three kids and so now you got that and kids who probably you know wouldn't get a chance to see the games during the during the school year and uh, again very impressed with with the crowd with the with the alumni is on with the with the alumni band i thought they provided atmosphere that that actually helped this team all right rico appreciate your time for rico cooney jim Comproni, you've been listening to and watching the michigan state spartanmag.com vcast with the spartans from breslin center spartanmag.com